Thank you again for all joining us um, in the bookshop. I'm very excited to have Neris Williams here. Um, coming all the way from Ireland, you took the ferry over, I believe. I did, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to introduce her, then pass her over, and then we'll have a bit of a Q&A afterwards as well. Okay. Originally from West Wales, Neris Williams lives in Kells Comeath. She's an associate professor in poetry and poetics at the University College Dublin and Fulbright alumnus. Neris has written extensively on modern and contemporary poetry. She's currently writing a book on the collaborative relationship between poets and radio producers at the BBC's third programme. Her first volume, Sound Archive, won the Strong Irish First Volume Prize and was nominated for the Forward First Volume Prize. A second volume, Cabaret, by New Dublin Press, came out in 2017. Republic, which is what we're going to be hearing a bit from today, um, a volume of prose poems was recently published by Seren in 2023. The volume asks, what constitutes a republic? Not currently Wales, our nation is subject to military claims on its landscape and a second home explosion which has hollowed out its communities. Republic is about class, culture and community in West Wales. It recounts the story of a young woman growing up and listening to the post-punk music of the 1980s and indie labels of the 1990s. These decades culminated in the explosion of Quill Cymru and a new dev devolutionary powers in Wales. Gwyneth Lewis proposes that Republic is a tour de force, a masterful account of the intellectual, political and personal, uh, which are some of the themes we obviously touched on yesterday. So that looking at that connection, that identity is what we're going to be exploring today. And she's got some music accompaniments um, kind of following nicely on from some of the poets that we heard yesterday. So if someone back there wouldn't mind turning off the music, please. Um, and then we can pass it over, yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, and then we'll pass over to Neris. Thank you so much for joining us. Great. Diolch mor iawn, Frey. A mae'n blesed i fod yn Aberystwyth. A wedi trafeli o i Werdfo, na Cels County Meath. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a great um, initiative. And thank you, Freya, for all your organisation. Also, I'm looking at my editors in the front seat here. So um, thank you for editing <laughs> and looking after me. Right? Okay. I don't know if Rianne is here as well, but uh, shout out to Rianne. Um, what I'm going to try and do here is I'm going to read. I, I think sometimes with poetry readings, people get a bit nervous. How long are the readings going to be? I'm going to read six prose poems, OK? Um, but I'm going to intersperse them with music from that time. This book owes a lot to Charlie Uzal Edwards for the front cover, um, which he supported Siren with. And I just want to give a shout out to him as well um, for his amazing kind of graffiti work. And he's originally from South Wales, but he's um, living in London. Um, so just maybe as a preamble where this book came from, it started 2015. It was kind of before the referendum um, and it developed as a way of actually um, handing over to my daughter some stories. Um, my husband said, you know, you should actually, I was telling him crazy stories about West Wales and when I was growing up, I, I grew up in a very Welsh um, speaking community. And, um, and then it became clear that there was something in the writing that connected a kind of movement from respecting Welsh language to actually loving a language. And for me, that was music. And that would have been the post-punk scene, if I can say that, the scene rock, Tanviarol, the underground rock scene, as it was known. Um, but it really did give a kind of potency and a zeitgeist to actually speaking Welsh in a way that no kind of primer at um, secondary school could do. OK, so that's just a background. It's not all about music, but I decided that for the sake of performance, <laughs> if I can say that, I will introduce and um, each each of the six pieces with a little bit of music because a lot of these musicians didn't get um, the kind of financial reward that they should have got during their time. So just to make people alert to their um, productions and their music. So um, first one I'm going to read is Gwynfor. I'm hoping Gwynfor doesn't need an explanation in Wales, um, but famously 
was um, anticipated, he was, he was prepared to go on hunger strike in 1980. And um, the first MP for Plaid Cymru. Um, what I have here is a sample of his um, son-in-law, Fred Francis, who might be known to some of you as um, an activist with Cymreitha Siriaeth Gymraeg. Um, and it's from a group called Llwybr Llaethog who have sampled Fred. And it's called Dill Deed Rice. So this is um, activism without violence in short. So let's see if we can connect up here. Just checking this is working. Eleven, one hundred percent. MacBook Pro disconnected. Ready to pair. Connected to MacBook Pro. Oops, I need to open the mic there. Connected to MacBook Pro. Uh -oh. Raise his icon. Great. Okay. Thank you. Connected to Marisa's icon. Sophie, don't worry. We really yeah, no, no, it no. was working before, wasn't it? No, it won't do. Bear with me for a second. I do this all the time when I'm teaching and um, it always goes a bit wonky. That's right. Eleven, one hundred percent. Marisa's icon disconnected. Ready to pair. Marisa Williams' is iPad. <laughs> That's not even in the... Icon one zero. Connected to Marie's icon. Applause. The stop the so that gives you a sense that thing was even trying to connect with things in ireland so i don't know what is <laughs> um, right Gwynfor. Writing against music, I try to find the momentum of days, the sound of a political poster being unfurled and put into my hands. I could be three, could be four. The banner is neon green and reads, Gwynfor. I am smiling. Is it from understanding or looking to the background? I am held on either side by parental hands. Look, they say, this is you. This is what it is to know a language that is presently dying. This is the language that we use, that we speak when we put on the immersion and pack our Christmas presents. This is the language we use when sorting out clothing on the line. This is the language that tells me what I have done wrong. This is the language hummed at night. Later, I would know Gwynvar as a man who was prepared to go on hunger strike. But for the moment, Gwynvor is the man with a benign smile, thanking me for reciting a poem about a small boy and a stinking fish during a political benefit night. I have memorised the poem and feel smart in my black and white striped rayon dress with its pussy bow. The poem is humorous, but I am thrown when adults laugh at the punchline. Did I do wrong? Make sure that you own the stage, my father whispers. Don't start until everything is quiet. Own the stage. What I should point out there, um, 
I it was, the poem was called Tomar Penwai. I didn't even know what a penwai was, which is a heavy. So it was always this kind of big punchline at the end. I didn't have a clue what was going on. <laughs> okay. So I am gonna. Yeah, I think. Um, Trovadovnes is the next band that was Flyver Flyver, by the way, which um, um, they kind of do a lot of dub and reggae pop, as they explain themselves. Um, but Trovadovnes was a band that became Tigridir and um, was really influential in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I really put dance music um, into Welsh, but I'm going to play an early work by them, which is called um, Welsh Tourist Board. Um, the original vinyl has got uh, a graphic design by one of the members of the band called Mark Lugg, um, which has got a t-shirt um, that says, I have been to San Vaid for Gerdes and As Welsh people we know, we're often asked to say that word. I'm off, asked almost uh, on a kind of monthly basis to say that word. Um, this is called Tea Half, and I suppose a kind of slight flirtation with um, docu-poetics or documentary poetry um i've got a footnote for this so tihav translates as a summer house um and just some interesting statistics that emerge from the pandemic i suppose um it is reported that almost 40 percent of property sold in gwynedd north wales between march 2019 and april 2020 were purchased in second homes uh a second home sorry in 2022 it was reported that 7.3% of houses were sold as second homes, uh, compared with 1.7 across the UK. So that's quite a startling statistic. So T Harv. This story starts the year the Cockatoo Twins release Heaven or Las Vegas. You saw Grangemouth's colours. The chemical plant was an inspiration for the 4AD record cover though you never shared this information with anyone until now. The year you get to know the owner of the second home near your village. She's researching a PhD, has made friends with your grandmother, walking down to the shop between periods of writing. Your grandmother tells her about your A-level results, how you are studying English and film far away. The woman is surprised that you go to university. She's not patronising, she was a housewife, a mother of three, the good wife of a somebody who works in a global auction house. As a smoker, the daily journey to your grandmother's shop becomes a ritual. Home one summer about to study in California. Before the interview, you swore you will not use the word invigorate and promptly did. <laughs> An afternoon party at the second home, walking close to hedgerows to the farmhouse, home to a doctor's skeleton that is now buried in the field. While you are hungry for discussions of Akhmatova, you are a spectacle in a cabaret of curiosities. 
These people mean well with their cheese, biscuits, wine and olives. But it seems derisory that the milking parlour is now a games room. They are polite. Tell you about Californian sights you have yet to see. Something, however, screams inside, throwing imaginary typewriters against the newly pointed stone walls. You want to cut the green bays of the snooker table with a sturdy kitchen knife. <laughs> I've got to think in snooker, don't I? <clears throat> okay. Um, right, I'm going to read Dada in Pontardawe, um, but crucially, there's a key band here that I, if you're not familiar with them, um, I think are really worthwhile looking up. Uh, Dutch Bluggy, who are so formative to people learning Welsh, people learning Welsh outside of Wales as well. Um, so let me just get this queued up. This is a song that connects, I suppose, with Gwynfor a little bit. It's called David Iwan and Aglaw. We all know who David Iwan is, yeah? Yeah, I have to explain all this stuff in <laughs> Ireland. So, um, so this is David Iwan in the rain, okay? And it's from um, their first final, um, Arikapi uh, Uyai. That, but I'm just having to stop there. Um, okay, so just to unpack a little bit of the Welsh, it's kind of like seeing your greatest um, folk star um, with rain falling down on them. So um, there's a kind of a um, an irony, I suppose, that David R. Edwards is always playing around with. Um, he's the lead singer. Dada in Pontar Dawe. You are watching your favourite band, Dutch Bluggy, sampling a hairdryer. David R. Edwards is making the audience wait, sound looped back to the synthesizer, creating the backing track for Christian and Akebutz. It has taken persuasion to get here, a road off the M4 to Swansea, zipping past new industrial estates post minor strike, opened by a Conservative minister in the Welsh office flanked by Labour councillors. Too young to drive, too young to drink. Your friend's sister agreed to chauffeur you to a community centre in Pontar Dawe. Screams of laughter twice round a roundabout. You reflect on how young women arrange events but never play. Preparing for gigs is cabaret, taking up the hem on 60s psychedelia marshalling the confidence of a red plastic Mac, or borrowing a father's choir tux before vintage became a knowing word. No mention of cigarette smoke or whiskey breath in the pickup. This experiment is part of the fabric of keeping Welsh contemporary. Das Blagi pen a song, Bar Hoyr, late bar, to taunt a hostile drunken audience. Dadaism and anarchy, the pertinent challenge to a respectability, haunting Welsh culture. Finding albums requires research, 
You explore music through political pamphlets, posting your essays with Liz's head upside down. During O-level revision, the doorbell rings. A friend is ushered in. It is Pat, Dutt Bluggy's basis on her way to Thomas's boathouse. That's to learn Thomas, of course. Delivering an LP. Shyly, you both sit on the patio, trying to find words to tell how much music means. Dark humour against raw guitar and insistent keyboards. How you chant on a daily basis. Rin teim la vel cam dei thasar iai. Meidin darllen chwilio am wai. Testing these assertions against your tongue. Reviews in the NME littered with analogies to Tom Jones and male voice choirs. But music's illusion open up another archive. Anger as baseline in public image limited. Ludic riposte in the fall, combative drone in the Jesus and Mary chain, lyrics as agitation for Patti Smith. That shift from the solitary eye to a shared possibility, born in the language you love. Okay. Anybody here heard of the kip? Some people might have done. Um, Catatonia, I'm sure. Um, cool Cymru. Um, before Catatonia, there was the Kirf with Mark, um, the guitarist, straddling both. Um, I just want to play a defro, which is translates as the awakening. You know, it's a burst of this. said that Kirf um, translates as corpses, okay, so just so you know that. Um, this is one of the first sections, I think, that I actually wrote as prosody, um, so it's called Listening. A time of open season on anything different, if you dressed differently, spoke differently to what was expected. This was the time of homogeneity. And England was as mystifying as it was unapproachable. A monument in the minds of others. Your language drains our resources, ruins our businesses, fills our supermarkets with bilingual nouns. The insistence of Welsh first on your signage. Yes, indeed, sir, madam, I nearly crushed the car on the roundabout. <laughs> in short, you are an anarchist language which threatens my possibility of getting A, job, getting money, B, for the services I demand, C, achieving a worthwhile and idyllic monolingual life. <sighs> Sanity, your language talks about me. Did I just enter <sighs> instead of D? <laughs> C, you have infiltrated my alphabet. I wanted to write A, volume, that was not a nostalgic b offered a document in its time c would make people understand 
In short, I was hoping for the magic of C.D. Wright and listened to her interviews while writing, hoping something might enter a sense of responsiveness to fill in the time delay between perception and its evocation, listening and its resounding. More than anything, listening was the agency I craved most. As a philosopher once said, that to listen will always then to be straining towards an approach to the self. The philosopher adds, once one is listening, one is on the lookout for a subject, something itself that identifies itself by resonating from self to self. I'm at ground zero in this argument, having to explain what it is to live in a language, our language, that shyly reverberates and shines, yet is questioned by at Newsnight, at Sports Direct. Can we afford your language? Are you not harbouring terrorism? I taste the word diaspora. Willing Welsh speakers in the world descend on the institutions that treat them shabbily, holding their Mr Ear of Gonks, waving placards in red paint, singing primary school songs, and generally being a nuisance in the Welsh language. I will that listening becomes a signature to a movement of thinking, an attempt to exceed the self, to overcome images which mean more than poor Tom Jones licking the last resonance of Delilah. I will that our language becomes a buzzing in the ear of the tribe, the six-year-old in me who looked in disbelief as the royal cavalcade sped through our small town. We were marched early that jubilee morning, waving Union Jacks. A friend thought we saw somebody raise a pale hand. Mm. That's my coronation for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case anybody was wondering. Um, okay, right, we're coming to the last two. Um, this next band, um, fantastic female voice, and um, we've been hearing a lot of male voices as well, but Erin um, Pruglis, which means um, dangerous plums, doesn't translate very well, okay? <laughs> but um, this is called a flask, and it's kind of an environmental song writing about the Brazilian rainforest back in 1987. I wish we could say we were further along, but um, here's, here we go. Um, they recently uh, put their work on, um, I think, Spotify and also on Apple. Okay, so if you want to um, look them up, they're, they're a brilliant band. Um, I love that synth music. Yeah. Okay, performance. There comes in your 30s the urgent need to become a rock star, a performing poet, and somebody who can handle a wardrobe. Speak to crowds without falling prey to your own ego. It is an indescribable need, not for fame, but the need for something that exceeds the self. 
You always associate exceeding with Levinas's words and this awareness as altruism. You see this exceeding all around you, dormant in the lives of women who have played it right, worked the rules, conscientiously filled the documents. Then POW, they want to become rock stars. They want to play bass like Kim Gordon, bare-legged in a long striped t-shirt. They want to smile beautifully into space, like Kim Deal interjecting, your bones got a little machine. They want to be held in ultramarine and fuchsia light and scale the octaves like Elizabeth Fraser. They dream of contorting their stiff bodies into a playful touching of fingers against lips, then scream as if Bjork was their voice coach. Or looking into the future, slide into noise with Belinda Butcher and no earplugs. This sound in your heart makes it difficult to attend meetings, look at spreadsheets, write references, fill in applications for funding. Answer questionnaires on how infrastructures are helping, loving, killing the power of literature. Young women that come to your office leave in disbelief. You urge them to buy an amp, forget their PR postgraduate course and pull off their shellac nails. You tell them it is right to have calluses in the tips of their fingers. The PVC trousers could help them think about their gender conditioning. You urge them to leave the trail of making of their life, to go to scrapyards and haul home car parts, use metal as a way of beating the percussive heart out of the system. It is another language you speak, one lost some time ago on the sticky floors of spent ballrooms. It is you shouting against time, wishing you could still slip into all those hurriedly made dresses, strap on your army boots and wander down the corridors of power, whistling. I think I'm a frustrated band member. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it's all turning into. Um, okay, the final final work then, um, extreme listening. And um, because I am from Carmarthen, I'm going to play a Carmarthen band. So it's this is actually the only work that's not post-punk, but it has a nod to post-punk. Um, band I'm sure you're, some of you are familiar with, Adwaith, and um, there's a kind of connection with Dutt Bluggy because I think that Pat Morgan was the producer of their early work anyhow. So this is called Mid Eyer, not Gold. you a sense of Adwaith. They just had their second album out, I think, um, last year, Bato Mato. Um, anyhow, um, great, great band. Okay, so this is called Extreme Listening. And writing this poem got a lot of good stuff out of me, that's all I can say. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm not giving the game away here, but... <clears throat> I want you to smile with this young woman. Might there be an affinity between you and her? She needs understanding, wants you to read beyond the tropes of religiosity which straddle the language she inhabited daily, until the language inhabited her growing inside. She made a truce with misspellings, botched conjugations and failing mutations. 
She searched for an answer to the question about her small country with its own language. Does all writing about community become about the trials that small communities engender? Her writing is an attempt towards encountering the problem. She cannot dissect in a language that does not love her mouth. But the language grew remarkable inside, gently from follicle to breathing cell, an organ, then a limb, the bubble of eyes, a spine sharpened, nickel in the dark. She carried this knowledge inside her, not as martyrdom, but as power. This woman, who has begun to love her language, walks into a hall at a prestigious institution where two men speak to an audience about Britishness, politics and music. One, an avant-garde poet, dressed as a skateboarder, asks questions of a journalist who will later become a columnist on Brexit. The importance of not liking Coldplay is iterated at many points, to knowing laughs, a punctuation point. Being in an audience, in a body with language growing inside her, its limbs and bent head expectant, she listens attentively to the discussion, the narrative of punk, telling many things she has heard late nights, the flicker of familiar documented images. The references are male and she is tired of the verbal winks and laughs inscribed in their exchange. It's performed knowingness. During Q&A, the language inside her makes her ask about the Mercury Prize and PJ Harvey's Let England Shake, a title with relevance to their talk. They begin smiling. Words are pats on the head until the language inside makes words that snip and grimace. I am so tired of hearing men talk about punk as if they invented it themselves. Silence. Slowly women in the audience add to the conversation. The need to think more about dub, trip hop, what the fuck is Britishness and a neat narrative falters. The swelling in her body tells her that they are threatened and unlistening, but it is always she who blushes on their behalf. Thank you much. Yeah. Thank you. you can see why I wanted to get the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. I love that music. Are we okay to maybe get a copy of those? The um, oh, yeah, well, I should have said there's um, there's a Spotify list. Mm -hmm. Seren have done a Spotify yeah. list, of, but some of the material is not on it. Um, I don't know whether it's to do with that it hasn't been uploaded or digitised in that way. But I've put what I should have said actually. Um, I'm glad you've reminded me. Um, there's a whole index of music that has got references there. It's the kind of weird academic in me that wanted to index. The <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it worked so well, and I think a lot of people are going to ask me about it. So that's how right. I okay. Them. Yeah. So there is a Spotify yeah, list, which is, useful, which is useful. Can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to play the music throughout, and how the music has informed your writing? As well? Um, I think without music, I mean, I think, you know, I don't want to be harping back to the pandemic. The music kept me going during the pandemic mm -hmm. and I was in a process of editing as well. But initially, I think it's to do with the relationship of language, you know? I mean, um, I think maybe at the beginning I said that I, I, I'm from a Welsh speaking background, but there were points at which my Welsh didn't feel good enough. But, and I think that's an experience that a lot of people who speak Welsh maybe have felt at various points. Um, who curates a, lang a language or looks after a language is really important. And sometimes the best people are not in that situation when you're growing up. And I think the music offered a zeitgeist, um, just a, an alternative form of Welshness as well, and an alternative culture and alternative music was inscribed in that. Um, it was also political. I mean, a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm probably, you know, speaking to the, um, the ley lines 
of um, political activism here, but Cymdeithas were great in organising gigs and it was a way of meeting other Welsh speakers, um, sometimes drunkenly, but it was it was um, about that community, you know, mm. alternative community. Mm. I love that. I wonder if you could talk, you talk a little bit um, about the identity and sense of identity just there and the, the politics, but between, you're now living in Ireland, yeah. which has also had a very kind of interesting, and I think there's a lot of links between Ireland and Wales, politically and um, personally between people. Mm. Could you talk a bit about those connections? I think that it's easier for me to write this book from Ireland. Mm. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's called Republic. There's a pun on... I was going through citizenship. Um, I've got dual citizenship now. You know, I'm I'm raising a child through the medium of Welsh. Um, she's a Welsh speaker. Um, there's also an homage to um, New Order's album of that same name. So, it, you know, it works on various um, levels, I suppose. But um, I think it came from a degree of dissatisfaction of not knowing how to engage with what was happening politically in Wales um, and socially. Um, I'm very concerned about many elements to do with our resources, child poverty. Um, I see every time I come back, Wales seems to me there are bits of Wales that are getting poorer and poorer and poorer. Um, and I didn't want it to be rhetorically, geez, you know, um, I didn't want to be arguing with people. so. What helped me, and particularly post-referendum, I think, was to use some of that public language and reframe it. That was really key. Um, I could have gone on a Twitter sphere rant and ended up with a pile on from the Daily Mail, but I decided the most positive thing to do was to reappropriate some of that language and actually maybe play with humour. You know, dare I say, you know, I thought humour, humour was really important to me. I didn't want this to be a misery memoir of any kind because, you know, it was about affirming the positivity. And I hope as well it offers a positivity for the future as well, mm. you know. Mm. Um, but I, I do worry. I do worry. I've got distance. You know, how can I talk about Wales? I don't live in Wales anymore. But I do worry I, coming from a republic and seeing the kind of breaking down of um, just supports for community and supports mm. for um, Welsh-speaking community, but every community, it seems mm. to me, um, you know, without getting too rhetorical about it. I think you do a brilliant job, and I was really interested in your choice of using prose form yeah. and, and that prose form in the poetry for that. Was there a reason behind that? that was... um, I'm very, very influenced by... Um, American poetry. American poetry opened a door to me when I was like 21 because I went on an exchange, um, studied at Berkeley for a, uh, a year um, as an exchange student and that really opened, that kicked it wide open. Um, but you know, it, it's the prosody I suppose, I felt I had too much to say. I didn't, in the past I've, I've written about similar issues but they haven't been read in that way or, or reviewed in that way, particularly in in the broadsheets. You know, it's always this kind of thing. You're a Welsh poet. You're you're slightly fey. You're kind of living in Ireland. You've got this Celtic twilight mist that surrounds you. <laughs> and um, I just felt I, I couldn't contain that. And I think that sometimes the lyric, I mean, some of the elements, I hope it, there's some element of lyric writing there, but sometimes the lyric, cannot contain and this is why i mentioned i think cd white is a fantastic american poet um sadly no longer with us another 